Today on In Grace, we're in Egypt, retracing the steps of the Exodus. The Exodus. There is no other story in human history that is more epic. Enslaved people find freedom from oppression. They journey to a land of promise. And on the way, mega miracles. The parting of a sea. The destruction of a pursuing army. Bread coming from heaven and water from a rock. Growing up, I loved hearing the stories of God's mighty power and provision. But as I got older, I started hearing people say that the stories about the Exodus were exaggerated or even mythical, and that the Bible could not be trusted. I decided to go have a look at the story of the Exodus for myself and see if it's true or not. Coming with me to Egypt is my brother-in-law, Neil. He's a pastor in Southeast Ohio and is also a man who loves God, the Bible, and adventure. And what we found was exciting. From the Great Pyramids to the Nile Delta, from desert routes to the probable crossing point, from the Egyptian side of the Red Sea to the Saudi Arabian side, from incredible oasis to the ominous Mount Sinai, this was going to be an epic adventure. And you're not gonna believe what we found. We have made it to Egypt. It's my first time back to Egypt in almost 20 years, and we're gonna have a wonderful experience here, I'm sure. When we arrived in Cairo, it was just as I remembered. Busy, dusty, a place of mystery and legend. We first stopped at the massive pyramids of Giza to think about the importance of Egypt in world history. Hey, Neil, we made it to Egypt. We did. Now, we've been here before, but it's pretty cool to be back and mm. have the, the Giza pyramids behind us. But uh, we're here on a quest. We want to really feel what it would be like for the Hebrews who were first here prospering and then enslaved and then freed mm. and, and follow that route. It's a lifelong dream to get to just experience the route that they took and yeah. just to be here. Just you feel the history when you're here. Yeah, and you know, to try to explore a little bit about some of the different theories of the Exodus, you know, talk about where did they cross the Red Sea, what body of water, just go through all those scenarios, but like literally we get to try to do it. Then we went to the fascinating Egyptian Museum. Here I wanted to get a good look at two things, the Menephtha steel, because it proves the existence of the people of Israel in Egyptian history, and a great example of an Egyptian chariot, so we would know what to look for underwater. All right, check it out, Neil. I'm hoping we find something that looks like that <laughs> in the water. That's amazing. Wow. Could this have survived three, 4,000 years? Mm -hmm. You know, the wood, if it was buried mm -hmm. in the mud, it could. Uh, if you didn't have the parasites and stuff eating it, the metal would certainly survive. Mm -hmm. sure. You know, they're pulling metal out that's thousands of years old, coins and stuff in Israel, and it's still fine. The thing that would be really neat is if you found a whole bunch of them, right? If you found- Well, that, that's um, what it should be. It should yeah. be hundreds right. of wheels that are down, scattered along the Red Sea. Right like it was just a big destruction. This is the original, mm -hmm. and this does talk about Israel, Merneptah's father, Ramses II, conquest of all of the people, and these are people now that are living in peace with Egypt, and there it is. You have Israel right there. Israel. And here's another thing. This also proves that Ramses II couldn't have been the Pharaoh of the Exodus because they were already an established nation in the land of Canaan at this time. And that was just a few years after Ramses died. So very impressive. 
to be here with the original and see that mm. and see you often say that if you don't believe the Bible, just keep digging. Yeah. And it's just so true. The absence of evidence doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It just means it might not be found yet. But the more people dig, the more they're finding the reliability of the Bible. And here it is again. The Menephtha steel was awesome, further verifying what we already believed, that the Bible is reliable and that its critics are off track. Next, we wanted to drive northeast to visit the location many believe to be Goshen, where Joseph and his family grew into a mighty nation. I had read that an archaeological dig had found a large city of Semitic, non-Egyptian people in what is known as Avaris. This sounded exactly like what the Bible said. But as we got closer, our security officer traveling with us received a phone call and was told that it was unsafe for us to visit Avaris as Americans. And we're gonna skip the next stop. Go to us go. So we'll just go to our hotel. This was upsetting, but we really couldn't do anything about it. So we rerouted to Ismala because it was still in the Northeast Nile Delta and it had a shallow lake that could represent what some erroneously said was a candidate for the Red Sea crossing. We find ourselves, Neil, at a lake, just, I guess, to the east of where Goshen would be. Mm -hmm. And the Suez Canal is actually just on the other side of this lake. By the way, this is called the Crocodile Lake. And my back is to the water. I was gonna say, yeah. you, might, you might wanna <laughs> kinda keep an eye out that way. This is intriguing because for decades, the whole Exodus journey and the supposed lack of archaeological proof has gotten a lot of people to be turned off to the Bible right. and to Christ and to God. If this isn't true, if this isn't accurate, this is one of the big stories of the Bible, the Exodus. Right. right. When people have looked at the Exodus and the biblical story of the Exodus, they have said that there's no evidence in Egypt of hundreds of thousands of people living here that weren't Egyptians. There's no evidence of the exodus, of the plagues and all of that. But then there's an archeologist, a professor of University of Vienna, professor of B-Tech. And he, about 50 miles away from here at a place called Avaris, today it's called Tel El Daba, located some unbelievable archeological ruins. Mm. So let's walk through some of the things that were found at Avaris. Sure, it was one of the largest cities in the ancient world. I mean, just uh, that alone is amazing. And they were, they were Asiatic, they are Semitic people. So that means that they weren't from Egypt. They didn't have the Egypt styles of pottery and, and you know animals and all of that. They came from Canaan or north of Canaan in Syria. They weren't from here. They were from where you would expect right. the children of Israel to be from because yeah. they came from Harem. They were North Syrian and they came down and were living in Canaan and eventually ended up here in Egypt. So that all fits with, Ta with what frame. you discovered. Time frame fits, uh, the, the population fits. Well, the time frame fits kind of. So there's the problem, Neil. Most people have assumed that the Exodus happened during the time of Ramses II mm -hmm. because the Bible says they were building the city. No. One of the cities was of Ramses. Sure. But there's a problem with that. We think that is a place name, that that's what it was called later, yeah. and an editor would have put that place name so that people later could read mm -hmm. that Ramses used to be Avaris. So the problem is they were looking too late yep. in archaeology. Yes. They, were, they needed to back up a couple hundred years at least. So the dating is a problem, but the problem is not because there's no evidence. The problem is because they were looking in the wrong centuries. Another big question is, how many? people. Now, the Bible gives a number of how many men of fighting age that were part of the Exodus, and it says 600 elephs. So an elephant is typically translated in Scripture, the Hebrew word elef, as a thousand. A thousand, yep. So that would be 600,000 men of fighting age, and then you add women and children and older men. People have thought, and I think there would have been up to two million people. Oh yeah. Now, could two million people have come from 70 people in 430 years? Because we know that was the time 
between the time that they were here in Egypt for yeah. that number of years. Could they grow that large? What kind of a birth rate would they have had to have? When we look at scripture, we find that the 12 patriarchs had 51 listed sons, which averages to 4.25 children per son. With that birth rate, they could have grown to 600,000 male descendants in the seventh generation, which fits the Bible's time frame exactly. If you take Elif, it's a word that doesn't always mean thousand. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the word means clan, division, or tribe. So if it's a smaller number, and some people have said that down to like a dozen, it's still a lot of people, but it's not sure great group of people. You're probably talking more like 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. So you have 2.3 million or 30,000. That's a big range. Huge difference. You and I have led tours to Israel. And I, after a week <laughs> or 10 days of 120 people, my, my hair is gray, yeah. my, my hair is missing. Uh, How did they yeah. do 2 million people logistically? Oh my. So great question. First, there's a big God that made the universe with a word. So really it's not a problem. But the reality is Moses likely had some history with some military campaigns and was a fantastic organizer. Yeah, it had to be that. Now God was helping them, providing food, manna, providing water from a rock, helping their sandals not to wear out. That's what the Bible says. So miraculous. we know the miraculous was part of this whole story, not sure. just the parting of the Red Sea or the plagues, yeah. but providing and helping them on this journey. Pharaoh, I don't think would have gotten that worried about that small of a group, but he would have been worried, Egypt probably would have been two to four million people at that time, of such a large group of people right. that was continuing to grow and expand. And that's why he enslaved them. It was another Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph, mm -hmm. enslaved them, yeah. and it was, it was horrible. It was a horrible life for those that were there. And again, that was God working because mm -hmm. he had a plan for this group. He didn't want them to always live there. He had a land, mm -hmm. a, a beautiful promised yes. land that he had given. So wow. the, the, even the slavery and the awfulness that they had to go through was a way of getting them to want to leave and to go be born as a nation mm. after they had crossed the Red Sea. So when we're talking about the number of people, two million people from Avaris and the area of Goshen making the journey, it feels like there's confirmation from scripture they all gave half a shekel when they got to Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. And if you add up that math, it seems to match the quantity of two million people. So you're saying Elif then in that scenario would match the thousand? Correct. Rather than definition. being a smaller number? The definition of okay. yep, Elif. So we're gonna go with the larger number because again, it matches Pharaoh being scared. It matches what you just said and some other as they were counting the people later on, it does still match the larger number. And we know some people did die, you know, in rebellion and things like that in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna go with that. This is a big, big group of people. And that also makes this a big, big miracle. We are always gonna side on literal biblical inerrancy. And even though it seems too large, God is a massive God and can do massive miracles. And so that's what I'm gonna stick with and I'm guessing that's what you're gonna stick with. Absolutely, there's no reason to make this into a small thing. Yeah. God is powerful and he doesn't need things to be scaled down so, so he can lift. Now, why do we think the starting point is a virus? We're, we're calling it a virus. The Bible says Goshen, and there are some other mm -hmm. lakes and things that have the top in them that would lead us to understand this is the area of Goshen. And my thinking is, Joseph doesn't want his family to be assimilated into the Egyptian culture. That's a really good point. So he's not gonna bring them into the cultural, close mm -hmm. to the cultural areas, but they still have to be in Egypt, mm -hmm. and this would fit the bill. They're under the protection of Egypt here. They're in Egypt proper, but they're not being affected negatively sure. by the Egyptian pagan culture. Why couldn't God have just allowed Israel to become a great nation in Canaan? Why did he have to bring them down to Egypt to become a great nation? It has to be because of the Canaanites. Very powerful. Uh, they would have not allowed them to grow into a, a great nation. They would have probably, you know, attacked them. So God says, okay, we're going to do this thing my way. God's way is always different than what we think. It's not by power, it's not by might. In this whole story, Joseph had it right. 
what you meant for evil, God meant for good. There's prophecy that this would happen. I found it in Genesis chapter 15, and I'm amazed. God knows the future, and I love that. It's such a comfort. So he said in Genesis 15, starting in verse 13, and he said unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. Mm. And I'm amazed at how God fulfilled that because by the time the 10 plagues had all happened, the people in Egypt were literally handing them anything valuable just to leave. Obviously, if judgment is coming on that nation, you wanna keep some distance between you and that nation <laughs> so the judgment doesn't fall on you. So in a parallel with today, we as believers are supposed to be living separate in the world, but not of it. So great point about separation. And another thing about that, judgment comes upon every person really that goes against Israel. It's true. So when you go against Israel, you're going against God. You are. So there's a promise of blessing to those that bless Israel and a cursing to those that curse Israel. So Egypt definitely got cursed in this whole thing. Mm. So there they prospered and they grew. They had a, a really great land. Uh, the Bible actually goes out of its way to say they were fruitful, they multiplied, they became this, this great nation. They also found, Neil, a house that originally was a Semitic style house but then it was torn down and built this big Egyptian style house. Hmm. And what was really interesting about that, that house had colonnades and there were 12 colonnades. Mm -hmm. Why is 12 an interesting number? Because that's how many sons Jacob had. And then around that palace, they discovered 12 tombs. 12 tombs. So when we're thinking of 12, we're thinking of the story of the children of Israel. Sure. We're thinking of the yeah. sons of Jacob, the yeah. sons of Israel. What about the statue and the bones inside that? So one of those tombs was the largest, it was a small pyramid tomb and it had a statue of a man. He was Asiatic, he was not from Egypt. He had a mushroom haircut, yeah. which was typical of not here, but up in uh, Palestine. Uh, he had a, what, throwing stick on his shoulder. What, so what did that indicate? Showing that he was a foreigner and that he was a ruler. So that's like a boomerang. Mm -hmm. uh, he had pale skin, again, not depicted of people of this area. And he had a multicolored coat. I mean, it's unbelievable. It if it's not Joseph, I mean, who yeah. else could it be? Possibly? And the bones are gone. A grave being empty is not uncommon here in Egypt because sure. of grave, grave robbers. robbers. Sure. But they don't take the bones. Right. And so they found this tomb empty of all of the, you know, whatever valuable things, but also the bones. So why is that significant? Because Joseph told his brothers, God is surely gonna visit you and bring you to the land of Canaan. And when he does, take my bones with you. Don't leave my bones yeah. in Egypt. And that's what they did. Right. They get released. That's one of the first things they do is go get the bones they of do. Joseph. Yeah. Imagine that whole arduous journey. They're carrying his sarcophagus or a box of his bones. Yeah. And today there's a tradition up in Nobilis yeah. where, and we're, I've been there, we're just we've been there, there yeah, yeah, that he is actually buried. And he's in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. Right. Joseph is in the hall of faith, mm. not because he you know, saved Egypt or he brought his family down to Egypt. He's there because he said, don't leave my body in Egypt. I love it. We are commanded to have the same type of faith. When we see the children of Israel wandering in circles for 40 years in the wilderness, it's because they simply didn't believe God. They didn't have faith. And wow, what a lesson for all of us. When God says it, we should accept it, embrace it, hang on to it, because it's true. All of these things fit with what the Bible says. Yeah. A huge group of Semitic people living in a foreign land, one with authority, yeah. it fits exactly what the Bible says about Joseph. So when people say there's no evidence for the Bible, yeah. the archeology span doesn't support the Bible, they're wrong. Right. And we need to just start studying the evidence. And one thing that's really blessed me, and I know you too, is uh, Timothy Mahoney's films, mm. Patterns of Evidence. Yes. Where he goes through these things systematically. They say there was no alphabet. So how could Moses have written the Torah? Mm. How could people read and write? Because that wasn't invented yet. Sure. But he uncovered the fact that they had found early Hebrew writing. Mm. And even our friend Scott Stripling sure. found that cursed tablet of Monty yeah. Ball that has early, early, early Hebrew yeah. writing, which is the Hebrew alphabet, a simplified yep. way of writing. Proto-Semitic, there it is. Yeah, so yep. in the Egyptian museum, they have these examples of the Rosetti Stone and another stone that unlocked hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics were very complicated, thousands of characters to spell things. It took a professional to write anything, mm -hmm. but the alphabet, a genius mm. invention, 
wow. was invented, that I think, so that we can know God, so we can Absolutely. know what he said and read his, yes. his word. What a blessing. Why couldn't the miracle of the Red Sea, and they would say, you know, the Hebrew word is Yom Su for Red Sea, and some people interpret that as the Sea of Reeds, mm -hmm. and so it's more of a freshwater, shallow body of water. But, you know, you and I are coming at this, this adventure, following the path of the Exodus, trying to find what that route would be like and live it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Why would we, as Bible-believing pastors, say, this could not be, or any of these shallow lakes could not be the crossing point? So I think this is obviously way too shallow. The Egyptian army could just go around and Well, yeah, get so, them too. right, why would they go through, mm -hmm. let's say this lake was split or any other shallow body of water sure. in this region. Like the Bitter Lakes just right. down the way. So why would they go through that? Why wouldn't they go around it and cut off the Hebrews on the other side? So sure. it really doesn't make any sense to me. It's too close. There are multiple places that talk about the depths that Pharaoh's army was swallowed up in the depths of the sea. And it says the water was a wall unto them on both sides. Now, what other verses does the Bible give about it being a deep sea? Uh, sure. So Psalm 77, 16 is one that I was just thinking of. The water saw thee, O God, the water saw thee, they were afraid. The depths, it says, also were troubled. Mm -hmm. It wasn't to me shallow, this is deep. Yeah, and remember, the inhabitants of Jericho, a point to the north of the sure. Dead Sea there. Yep. So right there at the very tip of the Dead Sea is, mm -hmm. is Jericho. Yep. They had been talking about the Red Sea miracle. They had heard about it. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't some little lake uh, that they crossed and you could almost wade across it. Right. This had to be a, a deep, big body of water. For all those reasons, I think we need to kind of check this off our list and look for a big body of water. Now, we have two options if we're looking for large bodies of water in the direction that they went. Gulf of Suez and Gulf of Aqaba, both coming off the Red Sea. Some people have suggested the Gulf of Suez as the crossing point. To me, this is more plausible. Mm -hmm. And if this is the Red Sea that they crossed, then the traditional Mount Sinai would also be plausible. Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem like it fits the narrative because the Bible says they went the way of the wilderness and they were heading to the mountain of God, Mount Horeb, which was where- In Midian. Yeah, where Moses met God in the burning bush. Sure. And that was where Jethro lived. That's where he had gotten his wife. That's where he was tending sheep for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And that's Midian and that's in Saudi Arabia. So the Gulf of Suez doesn't really make sense to me, although it's, Definitely a better option than this. Mm. And a lot of people on the, a lot of the maps say it was the Gulf of Suez. But again, the reason was because they didn't have that charted. You know, and we gotta blame the Greeks. I mean, my great-great-grandfather was Greek, but well, we, we so got Well, so it's really it. your fault? It's probably. Oh, come on, it, it's Neil. It's entirely my fault. We've been a country as United States longer than we've known where the Gulf of Aqaba was. So for literally centuries and millennia, people have been coming up with theories because they didn't really know what things looked like on the ground. And so I think that's why people have conflated these two, yeah. because literally you look at maps from, from hundreds of years ago, this is just not here. But Moses knew what the Gulf of Aqaba was because right. he fled to Midian. Of course. You know, he here did. in Egypt, yeah. he, he killed an Egyptian yeah. and you know, he had to flee and he would have taken the way of the wilderness mm -hmm. as this was the route that they were told to take. God said, don't go the way of the sea. The Philistines would scare them mm -hmm. and don't do that. We're gonna go this way. Plus we're going to Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. We call Mount Sinai today where uh, God was going to give the law and all of that. And that's where Moses had been. So this is the road. If you're gonna go from Goshen, Avaris to Midian, you're gonna take this road. Mm -hmm. This was a very well-traveled road. This route makes total sense to me. Mm -hmm. Now, some people say it's too far. Uh, how can you get from here to the Gulf of Aqaba where they would have crossed? And they think it was a, maybe a couple weeks that they would have made that transit. The Bible does give us some, some time frames once they get across the sea in I think 60 days and all these different camps. Could you make it with 2.3 or 2.4 million people, old people, animals, from here to the Red Sea crossing point within a few weeks? I mean, is that plausible? Is that possible? The people are physically fit, they're slaves. Yeah. So they're ready for a journey and mm -hmm. they have plundered the Egyptians, right? So they've been given probably ox carts, donkeys, whatever you need right. 
It really isn't that far. I mean, it's 272 miles from Avaris to the Red Sea crossing where we believe it happened. So if they traveled 15 miles a day in 18 days, they'd be there. You could either just travel at night, or if you were getting chased like your life depended on it, you could travel night and day. They had to get out of there. Now, yeah. Pharaoh said they, they could go, but mm -hmm. at any moment, remember, he, he had been changing his mind a lot he on been. all of this stuff. So he was They unstable. couldn't trust him. Yeah, so this was an emergency. They mm -hmm. had to get out of there. Yep. And if they're walking night and day, and there's something supernatural about this whole thing too. We oh. cannot underestimate that. Absolutely. Sometimes we just look at the Bible and we say, well, this all had to be by natural means. Yep. The Red Sea was parted by wind and wind only. Mm -hmm. Well, no, there was wind, but this is a supernatural thing happening. Yes. The Bible says that God carried them on eagles', eagles wings. wings. So they had a, a, a way to get across. People do that all the time. There were places to get water along this route because if you didn't have water, you couldn't cross the desert there in right. the Sinai Peninsula. They could get from here to the crossing point in the time frame allotted. I think so, and with the animals as well. You know, you've probably seen these Jacob's sheep. We have a bunch of those in Ohio. About three miles up from the church, there's these unusual looking sheep, and they are particularly hardy. If those were the sheep involved, because they're a legacy, that would make sense. A legacy breed, yep. and if they brought them down from here, and they were raising them here, and those were probably the same sheep 400 years later, and they brought them across here, surprisingly hardy, and those sheep could make a trek like that, I think no problem. Now, we know the starting point, we know that it wasn't the Bitter Lakes because it's too shallow. We know that it probably wasn't the Gulf of Suez. I'm not closing the door on that, but I'm saying it's definitely not, it doesn't really fit with the Bible as well as the other finger of the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba. So let's talk about the route. Now they're going through the Whale of the Wilderness and we're driving pretty much the same route. Now it, there's Can't not wait. a whole lot to see. We've done this transit a few times. I don't know if we've ever gone this direction though, have we? I, I have never yeah. gone from Goshen, literally starting there intentionally and driven all the way across to Aqaba or turn here to go down to Nueva. I've never done that. That route makes sense and that's the route that you and I are going to walk tomorrow. I'm super excited. Or minibus. Early the next morning, we left Ismala on what was likely the route of the Exodus. I could almost imagine what the people of Israel and Moses must have felt. The wind in their hair, slavery to their back, and freedom ahead that they could almost taste. Neil, can you even imagine what it would be like to be walking through the wilderness the children of Israel, hundreds of thousands, they've just had this incredible miracle of all the plagues and now they're free, now they're evacuating. Mm. And God told them to walk the way of the wilderness. We're in the Sinai Peninsula here. Earlier today, we were in Suez and that would have likely been the starting point through the way of the wilderness and they mm -hmm. would eventually got to Taba. What does it feel like for you to be walking in this same region that they would have been walking in the path of the Exodus? I have this overwhelming sense that I'm totally dependent upon God because there's just nothing. You you really can't stop at a 7-Eleven to get something cold to drink. <laughs> You're just dependent upon the Lord. And it's just so immense, this area. And just, I'm trying to picture what it would have been like so many years ago. On the route, they were on the way of the wilderness, the way that Moses would have taken to Midian. He was mm -hmm. taking them to the same place, yeah. the mountain of God. All of a sudden, God stopped them, hmm. and they didn't continue on the path that you normally would take around the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba or a lot. And we know now because God brought them on a, a specific journey to a specific place to where they were gonna be completely isolated and cut off yeah. with the Red Sea on one side, canyons on the other side, hmm. and the Egyptian army behind. God has a reason that he's bringing them into this funnel, Yeah. okay? It's a horrible thing to do strategically. Walls a thousand feet high on each side. You don't do this, militaries don't do this. You're basically entering a wadi system, and a wadi is basically a dry riverbed, and these are washes, and it's very common in the desert areas that, and you can actually see where all of the material was washed out into 
the Gulf of Aqaba, forming this big beach at Nueva. And here they go into this valley, getting more and more narrow, steep cliffs. And as we retrace this, it's incredible how it's almost claustrophobic as we're going through this. This is not a good situation if we're trying to escape Egypt and the most powerful army in the world. It's dangerous to go through a wadi in the desert ever. Flash floods can come through, but God said, go do this. You can't go forward because you have a massive body of water, mm. the Gulf of Aqaba. You can see across it, but it's big, it's, it's ten, deep. 10 miles across, Yeah, it's very deep, yeah, yeah thousands of feet. So you're in big trouble because yep. you can't go backwards because the same route that you just took that's yeah. narrow, yeah. now is filled with the Egyptian army. Yeah. They are stuck. They're stuck. They're on that beach. I just am impressed with the faith that Moses had because he had to know that going down the west side of the Gulf of Aqaba, you're just going into a dead end. And it was more than a dead end, the whole peninsula would be a dead end. But then to be led down this wadi by the pillar of fire and the cloud to where there's just nothing but, but a mountain on each side and the deep blue sea. Mm -hmm. And it's a half mile deep and physically, it looks like there's no way out. It encourages my heart to no end that if God leads us into a place that appears to be a dead end, he's not trying to kill you, he's trying to kill what's chasing you. This story encourages me so much because of where we are in our church growth right now. I feel like in a way God is leading us down this wadi <laughs> and he's gonna have to open up the path before us. One of the reasons I have so much confidence in the Lord and in the future is because of this story and stories like it in the Bible. It's just, to me, more confirmation that God is good and can be trusted. So let's talk about detours for a second. The, the times when God brings you on a different path, it doesn't make any sense. As a matter of fact, it makes the opposite of sense, mm -hmm. but he has a bigger plan and he, he wanted to show his glory. We're still talking about this right. running of the Red Sea. We had already had the adventure of a lifetime, retracing the steps of the Exodus. Next time, we will arrive at the beachhead where Israel was trapped, mountains on two sides, an army behind, and a deep sea ahead. Only God himself could get them out of this jam. And that is true for them, and it's true for us. Here in Egypt, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did great and amazing things for them. This is the same God that you can know. This is the same God that can do great and mighty things for you, but that's not why you should know him. The reason you should know him is because he is love. He is grace, he is good. We are sinners and we need to be redeemed by our creator. See, God loved us so much, even though we rebelled and even though we've sinned, he sent his only son, his name is Jesus. He lived, he died, he rose again, and he will save you if you will simply put your full trust in him and him alone. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Record every single In Grace episode. You will be so blessed as we learn all about God's world and God's Word. In Grace is a viewer-supported ministry. Thank you for your prayers and gifts.